Okay, so uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction, uh, and thanks for giving me this slot just before coffee break. Um, I, and sadly, I have no financial interest, but I would like to talk to you about uh, some of the cases of congenital corneal opacities, but more importantly, some of the common ocular surface diseases that I come across that often get confused as well. So why don't we just start with ocular surface disease first? So this is a case of a four-year-old girl with eight-month history of uh, redness, pain, and severe photophobia. Uh, the pictures that I took were actually during examination under anesthesia because it was impossible to examine her in the clinic. But uh, in the pictures there, you can see both eyes are very injected. Uh, if you pay attention to the cornea side, uh, you can also see that there are lots of corneal little dots, and these are infiltrates, scarring, uh, and areas of vascularization. Now, away from the pictures, there are uh, evidence of old as well as new chalazians. And really, that really clinched the diagnosis of this condition called blood flow keratoconjunctivitis, or I call it BKC. So BKC is a common problem, uh, estimated to account for 15% of all referrals to pediatric ophthalmology clinics. The age of onset is somewhere between four to five years old. Even though there are a range of uh, organisms associated with this condition, none of them has been found to be the causative agent. Now, the, the classic symptoms of BKC is a chronic red eye that fluctuates in severity, as well as the photophobia, which could be very intense, especially during the active period uh, of the condition. Uh, as I said, the history of chalazin or holiolum really helps to clinch the diagnosis in these children. Uh, but because of the uh, intractable symptoms and the, uh, uh, the subtle signs, it's often confused with other uh, infective or allergic conditions. And it's challenging even in our clinic to diagnose BKC because the lit appearance could be very, very uh, uh, normal and very subtle, as you can see in the pictures here. Um, the, uh, eye, the eyes are usually very dry, but again, the children are not usually uh, complaining about dryness or able to verbalize the dry ocular surface. Uh, they also can have uh, corneal scarring and amblyopia, and oftentimes that diverts the condition to other more severe, uh, more serious conditions of the cornea rather than looking at the lid and the conjunctiva. And because of these things, the delay in diagnosis has been estimated up to 18 months after the first presentation. Another special feature of BKC is flictanulosis. So a flictan is an inflammatory nodule that presents on the conjunctival surface and then slowly walk to the corneal limbus or the corneal margin here and then to the cornea. When it gets to the cornea, it can cause the opacity and vascularization. And in severe cases, the inflammation is so severe that the cornea can actually melt and form a hole and perforate. Now, the interesting thing is that the, uh, not all cases actually follow this particular pattern. Some of the corneal cases can just appear uh, in isolation. Now, the treatment of BKC is not really well uh, understood. This is probably the only a good study that we can find, and in a recent Cochrane review, only one uh, randomized controlled trial has ever been done in this condition. Uh, but uh, briefly summarizing it, in the mild condition, the mainstay of treatment is uh, lit hygiene and uh, dietary supplement. Uh, in the active phase of the condition, uh, topical antibiotics and steroids would be useful. In those who are active and more severe than the usual uh, flare-up, uh, I, I often add uh, oral antibiotics such as uh, tetracycline in the older children or macrolides like erythromycin in the younger ones. In those who have uh, frequent recurrences, uh, difficult to control with topical steroids, then I would use uh, typ to uh, often topical, uh, but sometimes also systemic immunosuppressant. Uh, the usual ones that I use are cyclosporin or tacolimus. Now, unfortunately, even though you control the condition, you can still end up with corneal scarring. So sometimes you have to do surgery to remove this scarring, and one of the forms is an anterior lamellar uh, graft, which is shown in this video here. And we can discuss a little bit more about the surgical technique later in the talk. Now, another uh, important uh, ocular surface disease is herpe uh, herpes simplex infections. Uh, and in children, uh, uh, they can present in a range of different uh, manners. First of all, in neonates, uh, HSV infection is important to recognize that it's a disseminated infection uh, due to a maternal active HSV infection uh, during the childbirth. Uh, they can present with a cloudy cornea, as shown in the uh, top right picture, and may conf be confused with congenital opacity. But when you put uh, the fluids in on, you can then see the uh, geographical ulcer right here. Now, the treatment for these conditions uh, obviously is going to be an inpatient and needs intensive systemic treatment. For the ocular surface, uh, topical antiviral uh, is uh, needed. Uh, in terms of recovery, uh, oftentimes these children are left with uh, residual scarring that affecting vision. 
In older children, primary infection can again present a variety of ways, as you shown in the pictures there. It could involve the eyelid, but it's important to realize that sometimes the infection can just come with chorizo symptoms and no physical rash. Uh, another important thing is that 10% of these children can have bilateral involvement, which means that it can be confused with infective, like a viral infection or allergic conditions. Uh, usually, and for these uh, primary HSV infection cases, I prefer to treat them with oral acyclovir uh, because topical acyclovir or additional topical uh, antiviral hasn't really been shown to be useful in preventing uh, an ocular involvement. When it comes to the cornea, uh, the uh, condition becomes more tricky because it's a bit harder to detect. It doesn't always present with the uh, typical dendritic ulcer. Oftentimes, students just come in with a stromal uh, infiltrate, uh, as shown in the top right picture there. Um, the serological, uh, serological testing, like a blood test, is not really useful in children. Oftentimes, it's just negative, so, uh, uh, which means that the diagnosis oftentimes is missed in quite a few of these children. Now, to add on that problem is that uh, childhood herpetic uh, infection tends to be more uh, carries uh, more inflammation causes more scarring and therefore more uh, visually significant um, issues. Uh, they tend to occur very uh, often, half the time, uh, half of the children will have multiple recurrences of uh, herpetic keratitis. And again, occasionally they could be bilateral and it's been up estimated up to a quarter of the children can have uh, both eyes in, uh, involved. Because the topical antiviral uh, that we have for ophthalmology tends to sting the eye too much, uh, children are not usually tolerating those kind of treatment. So uh, we often use oral uh, antiviral for these uh, cases, and the dosages are up there. Now, because the commercially available antivirals are, comes in 200 milligrams in five mils, uh, some authors or some clinicians uh, prefer to use an estimate from the age rather than the weight. And you can see it in, uh, in the table uh, down below. And to be fair, I think uh, it's useful because I think it's easier for parents to actually administer the correct amount of antiviral. Uh, and uh, the particular paper that discussed it actually looked at the body weight uh, of uh, different ages of children. It doesn't seem to have been overdosed. Uh, if we have to use steroids, then I would consider earlier and using for longer to control the inflammation that the keratitis can bring about. Unfortunately, despite all the treatment that we talked about, the sequelae of uh, herpetic keratitis in children is devastating. Over 50% will get a central corneal scar, resulting in 66% of amblyopia. Uh, obviously, the important thing also is uh, to consider that uh, the frequent recurrences and the frequent attendances to the uh, doctor's office means a lot of time out of school as well. Now, good things comes in three, so we've got to talk one more about uh, one more condition of ocular surface. This is a uh, three-year-old boy with nine-month history of redness, irritation, and then uh, for the last six months in the left eye, developed that uh, opacity. Uh, the past medical history has atopy and multiple allergies, and this is really a classic case of uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, or VKC. Now, VKC, just to confuse things, the uh, age of onset is just about at the same time, three to five years old, uh, and 50% uh, of these children have systemic atopy uh, at the same time, and that really helps to uh, uh, get you to make the diagnosis. Uh, it tends to exacerbate during warmer seasons, uh, but the important thing to remember here is that VKC always have this uh, symptom of itchiness and photophobia, and without the itchiness, it's really not the allergic type of uh, condition. The mucor discharge and the injection of the eye uh, tends to be uh, the useful indicators of uh, active periods of the condition. Uh, there are three forms of uh, VKC, but in general, uh, to summarize it, I would say that in the acute phase, the giant papillary conjunctivitis is the uh, classic sign, and that's shown on the top right there. Um, the important one not to miss, though, is the macro erosion or plaque formation on the corner, which is on the bottom right. And that's because they require urgent treatment, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In the chronic phases, the giant papillary can actually persist, and therefore it's important to realize that, first of all, it's not a sign of acute inflammation. It couldn't be there all the time. The second thing is that I found a lot of these uh, giant papillae goes away with time with medical treatment. Uh, I have rarely uh, needed to perform a surgical excision of these papillae. Uh, the corneal ch changes are varied. You can see the pseudogerontoxin in the middle uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, but in the severe cases, you can have limbal scarring, stem cell failure, and the corneal surface failure too. Now, the VKC treatment, just like BKC, has a step letter as well. And to summarize it, in a mild form, I would use a um, supportive therapy, antihistamine, and mast cell stabilizer. 
The agents that I prefer to use are olipeptidine and alcaftidine, mainly because of the, demonstrated, uh, uh, the evidence of demonstrated superiority over other antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. In the acute phases, uh, topical steroids is needed, and unless children are controlled with low dose or low potency steroids for the long term, uh, if patients have chronic recurrence uh, uh, condition, then I would prefer, again, using topical or systemic immunosuppressant. Now, for macro erosion and corneal plaque, as I said, they require urgent treatment. And this is usually in the form of intensive topical steroids, uh, fornacil injection of steroids, or superficial keratectomy. And this is a video of a superficial keratectomy we did actually just this summer uh, in a three-year-old in the same case that we presented early, early on. Uh, as you can see, we use a blade to lift the edge of the plaque first. And, and then actually using the forceps, you can just peel it off, and you can see the stroma underneath is actually very clear. And that's actually very satisfying to know. Uh, interestingly, even though the kid has six months of this opacity in left eye, he did not develop amblyopia, which is kind of lucky. A newer therapy may be on the horizon. Um, omalizumab has been used in uh, children uh, with severe uh, asthma as well as urticaria. And in some cases, our ophthalmologists have used it in patients with these conditions, asthma, urticaria, and concurrent VKC. And what they found is that the corneal and the conjunctival signs seem to have resolved within eight weeks' time. Now, obviously, this is an off-label use of medication, but like all the other uh, immune or inflammatory conditions, I wouldn't be surprised that in the future we get more and more of these biologics for uh, the allergic eye diseases. So in summary for the uh, ocular surface diseases, uh, common uh, conditions include BKC, HSV infection, and VKC. Children present differently from adults and may require examination under anesthesia for uh, making the diagnosis. Timely intervention limits corneal scarring and morbidity, uh, and uh, as always, young children, amblyopia treatment is crucial at any stage of the, of the condition. Now, the second half of the talk is uh, going to be on childhood corneal opacities, or I call it CCOs, and um, they are not common, uh, but, uh, and also historically, they were thought to be more like a lost cause, you can't really treat it. But luckily, I think from 1970s onwards, we've done a lot more work on this, and uh, my recent review uh, sort of goes through the uh, findings of the, um, the pathology as well as the surgical treatment. And I'll summarize the findings as follows. So the common entities of um, uh, CCOs are these ones. By far the most common are Peters anomaly and anterior segment dysgenesis on top, uh, top row. Uh, endothelial dystrophies are unusual uh, or um, uh, not as common, but they're important to recognize because the surgical treatment may be different. Now, not all corneal dermoids require uh, surgery, uh, but uh, this one that uh, occupies a whole cornea obviously requires something. Corneal scarring is usually uh, due to trauma, as you see in this case here, uh, but can also be due to congenital glaucoma, as shown in this case here. Uh, I call it depositional, but really it's like a metabolic disease. Uh, the mucopolysaccharides, um, like such as hurlers or hurler shields, can cause a corneal clouding that may also uh, require corneal transplant to improve the vision. Now in terms of uh, case selections, uh, there are a lot of different factors that one should consider before jumping into surgery. Different conditions have different risk profiles, both intraoperatively as well as in terms of long-term graft survival. And you can see it summarized in the table uh, shown here. Now, the age is also very important. Uh, in an infant with CCOs, the optimum age of operating is about three months old. Later, you have, the, you have to com uh, combat the effects of amblyopia, and earlier, you have a higher risk during the uh, surgery. Naturality is a bit of a controversial issue. Um, it's been discussed where uh, most of all, most of, the, most of the children with bilateral conditions will get, um, um, will benefit from corneal transplant. In the unilateral cases, some people believe that uh, it's not really going to be useful at all because of the overriding amblyopia, uh, the difficulty in getting the uh, eye to be seen, and so on and so forth. Um, I sit somewhere in the middle where I'm not as hardline saying all your natural cannot be operated on, uh, but in the right setting, such as with a really good uh, dedicated family, uh, dedicated post-operative management, then uh, sometimes those, some of those cases I would consider doing a unilateral transplant. And I'll show you a case later on in the talk. Before doing the surgery, you have to do the surgical planning, and all these diagnostic modalities are involved, and I'm very lucky that all of them are available where I work. Uh, ocular genetics is becoming more and more important, especially uh, for uh, genetic counseling. Now, I mentioned that surgical options are different, so let's talk about the full thickness uh, conditions first. So taking an example of Peter's anomaly, in a mild one, such as in the one on the left, you can just see 
uh, the opacity uh, and the little bit of iris adhering to the cornea. And that really can be just left alone. You don't have to do anything about that. For the slightly more extensive lesions, such as the one in the middle, the middle panel, um, sometimes you can use uh, medical uh, medications to dilate the pupil to allow the uh, child to see past opacity. And some other cases where the pharma pharmacological dilation is not effective, uh, you can also do an optical iridectomy, which is that you cut a section out of the iris and creating a new path for the eye, uh, for the eye to see. In the severe ones where you have extensive scarring and dense scarring all over the eye, uh, penetrating keratoplasty is the recommended method. Now that's the full thickness corneal opacity. For the partial thickness one, there are different options brought in from the adult uh, uh, techniques. For dermoids uh, as well as MPSs, the anterior lamellar keratoplasty in the cis, uh, in which we basically remove the anterior layer of the cornea and replace it with a graft can work very well. In the uh, posterior or the interior eye, the, the, the bottom layer of the cornea being diseased, then you can use, uh, again, a selected layer of replacement with uh, endothelial keratoplasty. And these techniques are very nice because uh, uh, they tend to have better graft survival and lower risk profiles uh, during the surgery. But this is a sur uh, f going back to the penetrating keratoplasty first. This is the case where I did a unilateral uh, PK because of uh, this children. This child had um, bilateral congenital glaucoma, but this eye particularly has uh, very dense central scarring. She was at the time four months old. Um, to do the surgery, the important thing to recognize is that the eye is very soft. The second thing is that the eye has a high pressure within itself, which means that if you just create an open hole, uh, like the usual adult method, then first of all, the eye will collapse on you. The second thing is that all the content inside will just jump out. And because of that, what we do here is do, we do a cut and cover technique. We do some partial excision, we put a temporary suture there, and then we put lay the graft gently over the top. Obviously not tying it tight uh, immediately, but to first of all remove the uh, opa opacified host cornea first, uh, and then the suture down the, the donor. And by doing this, you can control the time that the eyes are actually open uh, to the air, uh, reducing the uh, surgical risk that's uh, historically associated with uh, childhood PKP. And this is one year follow-up, and she has no rejection. Now for uh, partial thickness, this is a recent case that uh, we did with my fellow who's actually in the audience. Uh, for limbal dermoid, uh, this actually is an interesting case where the dermoid was first shaved, excised many years ago, and then uh, recurred, which is a bit unusual. Uh, and after delineating the lesion and doing some local dissection, what we found is that actually there were two layers of dermoid. One was superficial like this, but one was much deeper. Uh, and you see later on after this dissection, there's two layer of uh, defect. Uh, we use a cookie cutter to make a clean cut so that you can then suture the graph uh, in place. And you can see the cosmetic uh, result after suturing the graph down uh, is very nice. I have to say that usually the final judgment is actually in the clinic far down the lane uh, and we've, we've storing that round black circle really is what the family wants. Uh, whereas the dermal just disrupt that and the cosmetic result is not so good. The key to success in uh, keratoplasty, especially infants, is realizing that the post-op management is the important thing. Um, in general, uh, 18 visits is required in the first year after the surgery. Uh, the children require full examination, full glasses, and as well as MDOP treatment. And because the intensity of the post-operative management, family commitment really is important uh, in these cases. And in, case, in children who have, let's say, CCOs, but the family cannot commit, uh, I would probably afford surgery al altogether. Sometimes you have to realize that um, you, ha you can create con complications after the PKP, and this is a case where a cataract has formed after the uh, corneal graft is uh, performed. And luckily, because the cataract in children is very soft, we can just use a suction cutter for through keyhole surgery to remove the cataract. So in summary, uh, for uh, congenital corneal opacities, uh, there's a wide range of clinical ent entities. The pediatric keratoplasty surgical options is specific for the disease and the subtypes of the disease. There are important surgical adaptations to minimize intraoperative risk. Uh, we talked about the newer techniques from the adult field being transferred to the pediatric setting. Uh, but after all that, the most important thing still is the dedicated parental care by a dedicated family. Thank you very much.
Yes. In which uh, children you can use the Valacite review? Can you show one uh, case of uh, severe uh, uh, septic syndrome? Uh, please go from here to this point and we can find you the review. Uh, you mean topical? Uh, well, how do you use it? Um, for primary infection that is mostly involving the face, uh, I usually tend to just use orals. Uh, there's this thought that maybe it's near the eye, I need to add a topical antiviral. Uh, really, the evidence doesn't support that. I think the oral antiviral is all you need to protect the eye, actually. Okay, thank you very much.